I'm going to give you the wisdom of the rooster. This will never be heard of again. You will go, my God, I went to a church and the guy preached about a rooster. Well, you may get some understanding. The uh, Jews, uh, the Jewish people, they have a thing about roosters. And I'll tell you about it, a story about the rooster. Are you here today? Would you come along with me? And uh, once in a while move so I know that you're not a mannequin with somebody painted a face on. Just move a little bit, move your body, and that'll tell me, well, that's, that's a real person. Now, we take a lot of things for granted in our lives. Air, water, daylight, time, time especially. We take a lot of things for granted. How many of you believe that? And we take relationships for granted. We take a lot of things for granted. And, and for me, I learned a hard lesson. And I learned it by the loss of my mother at nine. Uh, it's a tough thing to experience the loss of a parent at that early age. And, and really, you can find that when I reflect back to it, I took a lot for granted. Everybody has a mother. Everybody does. Back when I grew up, though two, fam two in a family was the norm, not a single family thing. I don't think I knew of a single family situation, and that might have been my own limitation, but I'm telling you, it was extremely strange for me to understand that. We had mom, had dad, and then to lose them uh, was like I was the weird kid in the school. I was the weird kid in the neighborhood. And the kid would say, well, I'm going home to mom. I'm going to get my mom to cook. I'm going to get my mom to do. I couldn't do that. Well, my dad's going with me. I couldn't do that. And I thank God for the time that I had with my dad. It was a fruitful and great time up till I was 17. And, uh, but we take things for granted. How many of you hearing me today? We take church for granted. Go to these countries I've been to that Antonio was referring to, communist countries. I've been in China when it was under the communist rule. I've been there, smuggled Bibles in there. Into Ukraine and Russia, when Russia broke open, we were some of the first people there. We led 10,000 students to the Lord and uh, put them in, in an auditorium and ministered to them week after week after week. We planted 124 churches from that. God let us be in the incubation of a lot of things that have happened over the last 30, 40 years. We put 400,000 kids on the mall in D.C. called The Call. And uh, so we know a, a, a little bit of what we're saying here. When I say that, we can take things for granted. And all of a sudden, what we know is not there. How are we here? It's the same thing with human life. You can be laughing at dinner one moment and the next, gone. And so we need to reflect for a minute. And I, I want you to uh, really gather this up with me today and listen intently. And so we take advantage in air, water, daylight, time, all that. Time is one of God's most precious gifts. And I spoke to you about it in the offering. I'm going to bleed over into the message a little bit because I felt the two needed to come together. And it's the most precious gift to us. It is the most significant non-renewable resource uh, at our disposal. It's a non-renewable. I said that earlier. I'm repeating myself, but I want you to get it. Time cannot be. You're never going to go and never, ever be an hour ago. It's gone. And we need to see life that way because it can become something that you just think it's just guaranteed. But now you know, life is precious. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And we need to learn how to value life, value what God has put in our life, who God's put in our life. We need to learn to value these things. Can you hear me today? And I, I saw a little YouTube ad, a little YouTube thing the other day. And uh, it was about a young girl. You may have seen it. It's had millions of hits. And it was a, a, a young uh, millennial young lady. And she's a nurse. And it was a patient who's dying 
and she sang the song of the Lord. Oh, my God, she sang, and how heaven was rejoicing, and how heaven was looking forward to her being there, and all of this. And the lady, of course, uh, died, I think, a day or two later, but she sang with this woman in her last hour. And you could see the passion. You could see the love as she held her hand and sang to her. This is just a nurse. I mean, she's not, you know, she's not... uh, a family member that was the daughter, I think, who videoed it. And uh, because it was so powerful uh, and it moved my heart when I saw this girl doing that. How many of you know when we have less of it remaining time, when we have less of it remaining with each day passing day, it makes us stop and realize time is valuable. Can you hear me? That's why you see silly little bumper stickers, hug your child today, do something like that, say something kind. I mean, you know, the scripture tells us to do that. And, uh, you know, it's important. My wife and I, we never go to bed at night before we have a, a moment to stop and kiss and make sure we've done that. How many of you know that those little moments can be valuable in the long term and in the bigger picture? And I never leave my house without that, without a friendly uh, gesture, without some kind of contact because it is important to understand the value of what we have right now because we can't come back to it once it's not there. Everybody understand? So if you haven't hugged somebody in your family, go back and hug them today. That's just for free. Now, when God gave this gift of time, he intended for us to use it carefully, intentionally, wisely, and productively. I'll say it again. When he gave us this time, this gift, he intended for us to use it carefully, intentionally. That means that you organize your time. That means that you develop some some disciplines with your time. One of the saddest things I see around me is people who have no self-discipline. I want to tell you, I can prove it. I've done it for better than 40 years now. I've taught a class on how to uh, manage your time, and I can prove to you that you cannot account for 25 hours a week in your 178 hours to be on the earth a week. There's 25 hours a week that you don't even have a clue that you lost. Well, that's not a big deal, but let's say that's uh, $20 an hour. Anybody do the math? $500. $500. How many of you can throw away $500 a week? I'd like to see your hand because I'll put my plate out here real quick. And how many of you know that it's true that we don't manage our time and so what happens is the world manages it for us. And, and, and God gave us this gift of time and we have to be careful with it by not letting people who want to squander our time, waste our time, while we don't sit in front of stupid idiot television programs that waste our time. Should have been a thundering amen. Watching those dumb sitcoms that make men look like buffoons, make black men look like idiots, make women look like dictators, and we think that's cute and funny, that's a waste of time. You're not careful with your time. Wow. And then, of course, intentionally, that's that discipline. Wisely means that there's a choice in life every day. I can choose this or choose this. Usually there's several choices, but at least let's limit it to two. You got a choice. You can serve God or not. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You have an opportunity every day to serve God, to discipline yourself, to learn how to bring yourself into compliance in this book. You have a choice every day. What you choose to value in God because he gave it to you, you will get a return. What you choose to not value and give to him, you will lose forever. The Bible says, 
Every man is going to give an account of all things that he said and did while on the earth. Everything you said and did, you're going to have to stand before your maker, God, and you're going to have to give an account. And how do you know I don't want my ledger to have more things I did for me than I did for him? I don't want my ledger to be out of balance. Anybody still here? And then it says productively. So carefully, intentionally, wisely, and productively. Productive means that you would bear fruit. If I invest in money in something, I expect to get a return. Anybody understand that? I've been watching silver. I'd like to see silver jump up. I have a little bit of silver, so I'd like to see it. Somebody said it might jump to $200 an ounce. I'd like to see that. I'd make a bunch of money. (laughs) How many of you know investments are important to look at, right? Well, how many of you know if I have time, time, this most precious thing, I will never get back what I just said 15 minutes ago. It's gone. And if that time is that important to me and I get to invest it, should I not be selective where I invest it? And should I not want to return on my investment? Anybody still here? How many of you know we live in a culture of wasted time, wasted life, wasted energy? People are lazy, get on the couch, stuff their face with food, have ill uh, problems, physical problems and then can't do, and then can't, and then complain, and then the next thing you know, a day's gone, and then a second day, and then a week's gone, and then a month's gone, and what have they done? Nothing. We have a generation of snowflakes that produce nothing. And God wants to change that for the church. We should be the greatest time managers on the face of the earth because we understand creation and we understand time. We understand moral value. Is that true? Come on, stay with me now. If your life is a gift from God, it is, I said it before, then time is the organizational foundation of that life. And uh, you are, then you are honoring his plan when you do and blessing him with the fruit of your life. When you use your time well, your time is invaluable. When you serve another person, you are honoring that person with the unique outcome of your, of your uh, irreplaceable, is a good word, I guess, uh, existence. Your irreplaceable existence, you are honoring that person when you give to a person. How many of you know the Bible says serve one another? Amen. Ephesians 5, put it on the board please. Ephesians 5, 15 and 17. Ephesians 5, 15 and 17. And I need you to try to come with me. Is anybody there today? No, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm in the back. Okay, so we don't have anybody back there. Oh, okay. Well, I want to see the scripture please. Ephesians 5, 15. Okay, and uh, it says, look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, (laughs) but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. How many know that probably just tells us clearly how we should walk? Making, look at verse 16, making the most, the very most of the time. How many say to the Lord, Lord, I want to make the most out of my time. How many of you want to lose $500 a week? Then how many of you know I can prove to you that you lost? How many of you went to my marriage class? Put your hands up. How many of you know I proved to you that you lost 25 hours? True? I can prove it to you. You can't account for 25 hours. It's because we waste it. I'm not talking about the time you spent driving, eating, sleeping, working, I list all that. But if you can't account for 25 hours, you need to stop a minute and take a recount and see if you can't get back some of that time. How do you hear me? Because time is all you have. Now, how many of you know you get paid according to time? How many of you know you have birthdays according to time? How many of you know you celebrate things according to time? 
Now, look what it says, verse 16, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity. How many of you want to buy some opportunities today? How many of you want to buy some opportunities today? Come on, look at me. How many of you want to buy some opportunities today and turn some things around and get back some, some uh, uh, increase on your investment? You want to buy some time? How many of you want to buy some time today? This is called time sharing. We're going to time share in the kingdom. Now, verse 17. Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. How do you hear that? And then he goes on, don't say, get, don't be getting drunk and getting into debauchery and all that kind of stuff. We won't go there. But I want you to know time is so important. In the New Testament, I mean, the Living Bible, it says it this way, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How many of you know, we need to know that day is evil. How many of you know today is an evil day? It's everywhere. And how many of you know, before you can even think, you've invested some time in something foolish? Hello? And how many of you know that time never, ever can be bought back? Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Have you say, Lord, I want to count my days so my days count. Oh, come on, back to me again. I want to count my days so my days count. Some of us in this room, you're the same place you were 15 years ago because you do not honor God with your time. And you're not growing, you're not multiplying, you're not reproducing, you're not changing. You're the same sour puss, miserable individual that you were 10 years ago. Because you're not making any investment to change. How many of you know, saints, if I don't like my marriage, I better work on it. If I don't like my economy, I better work on it. When I first came up here, I didn't get paid a lot. So I had two jobs. My wife will tell you, I worked at night. I hung sheetrock and wore stilts and did mud jobs and did part-time work so I could pay for my children and pay for my family and do what I needed to do. How many of you hear that? I had a company. I began to make that company grow and I had it when I first came up here. And I had a company and it began to grow and it began to multiply. And I worked at the church and I baptized and I preached and I shut the door down and I framed the building and I put the walls up and I, I worked and I worked and I bulldozed the whole half of the hill up there. And I worked and then at night I went to work. Why? Because I wanted my economy to change. And I knew I had time, so I invested my time, and I got back a return. Hello? And some of us think that somebody else is going to pay it. You know, you got to listen to me today. Colossians 4, 5, conduct yourself wisely toward outsiders, making the most of your time. How do you know outsiders mean outside of your circle? You should be real wise about who you let in your circle. I'm not talking about witnessing to sinners. I witness to sinners all the time. I told a story the other night. Went in a hardware, a little mom and pop shop, and saw a Bible, and I started a little revival right there. And uh, how many of you know, I love to witness, but we got to learn something. If you read Colossians, it says, conduct yourself wisely toward outsiders, making the most of your time. How many of you know the devil will send you people who are time thieves? The devil will send you people who are thieves of your time. They will steal your attention. They will steal your time. They'll steal your dedication. Hello? And have you know, they are not sent by God. They are sent by the serpent, the devil. He sends them because he knows that if he can steal that time, you won't give it to God. Remember this. Every bit of time you spend for the world is time you can't spend for him. 
Hello? Still here today? You can read this in the New American Standard. You can put it on the board that way if you like. I'll read it in the New Living. You can put it in King James. You can put it in all these different translations. Psalm 39 and verse 4 and 5. Lord, remind, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. How many of you know you need to have God tap you on the shoulder and remind you how quick this can be over? Have you ever heard anybody that's had a brush with death and how they came away valuing the important and the non-important they kind of blew off? Hello? All you got to do is have a brush with death and you begin to appreciate the sun rising. Hello? All you got to do is have a loved one at the brink of death and you appreciate that loved one. Are you hearing me? And he said, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered how fleeting life is. Wow. Time is so important. Time and giving are inseparable. Time and giving are inseparable. The value of the gift is in what the act of giving communicates. I say it again. The value of the gift is in what the act of giving communicates. And one of the greatest secrets, how I many you know I've been preaching on Thursday nights about secrets that are in the Bible? I, I hope to continue. How, how many of you know that there's things in this book that have not been discovered by humans yet? And it's because there's not the right time. How many of you know when Israel could not figure out that it was a nation, uh, two boys playing in a cave in Israel, two Arab boys in a cave found some jars and they found these, uh, these jars made out of clay. When they looked inside of them, there were scrolls inside and they ended up being the Dead Sea Scrolls. Which, what did they contain? They contained the book of Isaiah. And how many of you know that that was just right there when Israel was getting ready to go to war and it was when Israel was getting ready to have to defend itself because it did not have history of record showing that it was the children of Israel. They were the elect of God. They were his chosen. And when they found the scrolls, they read them, and, and I've seen the scrolls. They're in a museum in Israel. And you go there, and you see this thing, and it caused that day for Israel to defend itself like no other time. They fought a war against Egypt that there's no way they should have war, uh, won. If you do the history, you'll see they fought a battle they should not have won. But they outnumbered their enemy, not by power and might, but by the Spirit of God. And they defeated the enemy because now they had a cause and a reason to war. Can you hear me? And how many of you know time was crucial to that moment? How many of you know time is so valuable we must learn how to treat it? One of the greatest secrets I started to say, God in, in the scripture is God is unveiling in, in these days has to do with something called biblical holidays or feast that are found in the Old Testament. I'm not going to drag you through that. Some of you can't, can't manage it because you have no Bible background. So I'm not going to take you through that. I'm just going to tell you a little story about it a little bit because on Thursday nights, I'm helping people grow in the word. So if you want to come to Thursday night, you can learn some of those things. How the Old Testament complements the new. It is a shadow of the new. How many of you know you have to have both testaments? It's a one winged bird. You have to have both old and new, or you will not grow. Now, in that, it's important knowing these hidden things, these many hidden truths that God wants us to know are truths, no doubt that we will only understand by reading the Bible with a Jewish or a Hebrew mindset. If you don't understand, I don't mean you have to understand Hebrew, you must understand the Hebrew. 
the personality of the Hebrew. You must, uh, Jesus is walking down the road and he says, if you don't worship me, the rocks will cry out. People look at that and go, huh? If you go to Israel, you'll see there's billions and billions of rock everywhere, little stones, rocks everywhere. They clear them out, make walls in their fields. They clear them for the roads. It is so rocky, it's hard to imagine. Yet Jesus took the natural element and brought it into a New Testament truth that if we didn't worship him, the rocks would cry out. How have you know the Old Testament has parallel story in the New Testament if we just would look and ask God to open these secrets, we'll begin to see the Bible different. We must see it from a Jewish and a Hebrew perspective or mindset. How many you know Jesus was a uh, Hebrew? He was a Jew. How many you know when Jesus walked down the street and the woman touched the hem of his garment? How many you know it was the telet? He had on a toilet. It was a shawl. He had it on. It had tassels on the bottom. It was from the Old Testament. They were always were told. And when they wanted to get in the secret place, they threw up the, the toilet and put it over their head, closed it, and that's where they got in the secret place. And have you know, we call the secret place all these other things. It's a closet. Jesus said, when you get out ready to pray, go in your closet, shut the door. The Hebrew uh, understands the, the, the Levitical priests, the rabbis, they understand that language today. If you say, I'm going in the secret place, they will take their toilet, pull it up over them, and they're in there. So we need to know how did the Hebrew think? When the woman touched, she touched the tassels. She didn't touch some long dress he was wearing or some silly outfit that people try to portray. They touched a Hebrew toilet. It's already in Leviticus, it's in Numbers, it's in Deuteronomy that they were supposed to wear that. Are you hearing me? And because we don't understand, we will say things and look at scripture from a American viewpoint. And I want to tell you something, saints. We're at the bottom of the list that can interpret this book because we don't know what a king's like. Hello? Matter of fact, we rebelled against a king and ran from a king. So if you want to know what America's dealing with, we're dealing with trying to interpret a scripture that we hated what the scripture supports. We fought against a king, the tyranny of a king. I understand that principle. But we wanted to get away from it so bad, we have a hard time understanding who the king of kings is. Wow. Can you get this today? And how many of you know, if you don't have a concept of scripture, understanding from a Jewish perspective, you just put something in there. Can you hear me today? Let's go a little deeper. You still with me? Now, there are three feasts that I mentioned a minute ago, and I have to give you what the names are so I can get past it. There are three feasts that God is opening. I'm still going to talk to you about the rooster. How many of you want to hear about the rooster? Okay. You say, how are you going to get to the rooster? If you get in the car, all you got to do is ride. I'm on automatic pilot, Holy Ghost led. Get in the car and shut up. We'll get there. Don't be asking me, are we there yet? Don't be asking me, when are we getting there? I hear some of you. Is he there yet? Is he there? Where's the rooster? Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? Get in those trips and the kids ask you all the whole, are we almost there? Are we there? We were 10 minutes out from a trip recently with my youngest son, and he told the kids, we're two hours away. Oh, well, they went dead silent. I said, that was smart, because we got there in a few minutes. We had at least a little bit of peace. All right, listen up. There are three feasts that God is opening up to each of us today, to the believer, that will help us understand God and his sovereignty and his divine time. There are Passover, Pentecost, and Sukkot. Sukkot, or Sukkah. You could say it that way, Sukkah. S-U, it's really uh, S-U-K-K-A-T, Sukkah. Sukkah is the word for Feast of the Tabernacles. So there's three of them, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. 
Feast of Tabernacles was incredible. They built outside uh, slats of wood and they ate a meal outside so they could remember what Israel had to do when they came to the Feast of Gatherings. That's what it means. They gathered and they had nothing over them but the canopy of heaven and they ate in the starlight. It's a whole beautiful story. Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, it says, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Now, please listen to this right now. This is really, really very important to what I'm trying to say here. The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts, he says. And Israel had no choice. They had to go to these feasts. They had to participate. They still do today. They had no choice. God would not show up if they didn't do this. Are you hearing me? Now, Hebrew word there for feast, how many of you want to hear it? Hebrew word translated as a feast means an appointed time. So when you hear God say, I have these feasts, the Feast of Pentecost, it is 50 uh, days from the resurrection, okay? So that's after Passover. So from Passover, you have 50 days to Pentecost. These celebrations, they mean, the feast, mean an appointed time. How many of you know that God has an eternal clock? And he sets it, and on certain times, he does remarkable things. I don't have the time, but I can show you through Scripture. And those of you that are sleeping, please wake up, because it's nothing but a satanic spirit trying to seduce you so you don't hear the truth. And I want you to hear this. God has appointed times that if you go back, I don't have the time today, uh, but if you look at it, you will see, here's an example. 450 times God used the word first because he wanted to show people on the first day of the first month, on the first day of the first month. And it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And uh, John said in Revelation, and the first voice I heard, God has a repetitious pattern that he follows, and he follows it like clockwork. Have you here? That's why we have days and seasons and things because when God created everything he created it with a time factor are you hearing me so the word there is feast means an appointed time God told Moses to explain to the people that these feasts of the Lord were appointed times that means special appointments for him when Israel got together to do the Feast of Tabernacles, it was the response back to God that drew God in to their midst. How do you hear? When they honored God at his appointed time, it obligates him to show up. How do you want God to show up? How do you want God to show up in his revival, in, in, in our midst? Well, the appointment of his time, our obedience to the appointment causes him to respond and say, they've met the time, I'm going to show up. Wow. Have you hear this? Now, these three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and uh, Feast of Tabernacles, these appointed time feasts were special appointments, as I've said, with him to receive revelation and experience and blessing. Let me say this to you. I'm going to go a little further, and then I'm going to bring you right to the rooster. When we have a convention to celebrate a year of having success in God, do you know God made covenant with me that on those days, if I would honor him, he would show up? God gave us those times to come together, and if we came together, he said, I'll show up. How do you understand? 
But because we think we're under our time, we dismiss God-appointed times and we replace them with selfish time. If you want God to show up, change your watch and get on his calendar and he'll show up because he pre-ordered himself by being who he is. He said, if you hold the tabernacle, feast of tabernacles, I'm going to show up. If you have Pentecost, I'm going to show up. Did he show up at Pentecost? We call it Pentecost Sunday. No, it's Acts chapter 2. He heard 50 days, boom, and fire came from heaven because it was the right thing. Time. I mean, you say, Lord, show up. Can you say that again? Say, Lord, show up. And God says, not yet. Oh, how do you know there's a right time? How do you know when Abram offered Isaac, there was a right time? And have you know the ram was already coming up the hill while Abram's getting ready to kill the boy. But at the right time, that lamb went bah. And Abram stepped back and God said, Abram, Abram, hold up. I know your heart. I know you would not keep your son from me. And so now I provided a supply for you. Have you know crops work on a time? How do you know fish? I know the ocean like I know my hand. Fish move by the clock of time. The greatest marlin fishing and big game fishing in the world is on full moon. And all the big tournaments around the world where there's millions of dollars in catching these massive fish is based on the full moon of the ocean because the ocean is different during full moon. It's a time factor. How do you know the sun comes up on a time? The moon comes up on a time. Can you hear that? Thank God. God is never late. Say, Lord, come. Say, Lord, come. God was saying, in effect, I'm going to uh, reserve specific dates on my calendar, God's calendar, for you to reconnect with me and with my plans to bless you spiritually, physically, and financially. God said, I'm going to set my calendar if you'll set yours. If you, Israel, will set your calendar, I'll set mine in heaven, and I'll be on time. How do you want God to show up? we etched out a time called the first week of November that we celebrate the victories of God, the goodness of God. That's why we bring in our outside sons. We want to celebrate as a church together and say this is the time that God put on his calendar for us. Have you say, Lord, I'm going to mark it down. But see, some of you, you don't have time for God. You have your time. And that's why you walk out of the blessing instead of into the blessing. How do you know you should not be a Christian and be saved the years that some of you have been saved and not be walking in the fullness of God's purposes and blessings? But because you have your own time, God never has time to bless you. He sends the ram your way and you're not there. He sends the blessing your way and you're sidetracked. Come on, saints. You say, oh me, you're amen. But I've been in this long enough to know. I've watched people who walk in blessing. I know people today that came out of the ghettos and they are worth hundreds of millions of dollars today. Why? Because they got their time with God right and because God's time became their time, seek ye first the kingdom, God blessed them. I say, Lord, I need to get my clock fixed. You still there? Let me help clear some things up now concerning this. Matthew 5, 17. We're talking about all this stuff of the Old Testament. This is for the skeptic. Do not think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus was saying I didn't come to do away with the Torah or the law, but to show you how to live it, thereby releasing God's power and blessing in the use of the law. 
Notice this, the word law. How many of you know we use the word law and we use it sometimes incorrectly because the law used in the scripture is used two different ways. The Greek word for law is do's and don'ts. The Greek word for law is do's and don'ts. The Hebrew word for law is pathway. How many say, Lord, light my path? Come on, revelation of truth is a light unto your path. How many say, Lord, I need to see where I'm going? Anybody here today? I mean, some of you, you, you want to sleep rather than you want to come to church. I don't understand it. I'd be alarmed. I'd be afraid that God has just took his hand off of me. That I'd be so callous with my time that I don't get proper rest. And so because of it, I'm not awake when the word of the Lord is proud. When Jesus wants to show up, I'm not even awake. How arrogant. If you invite him to come, how would you like to invite me to dinner and fall asleep at the table? I went to see a man I grew up with, loves the Lord. He, he was saved. Healing flowed through his ministry. I knew his kids. We lived across the street. We owned a boat together. We did things together. We were in church together. We were great friends. He backslid. He was hiding because he, was, uh, he stole $350,000 from some people, and he's living in the Caribbean. I went, and I found him. I had to take a seaplane to get to him. That means it lands on water. And I went and got a set-up deal. I went and got him. I went and found him. When he came and got me at the airport, he was so drunk he couldn't drive his own truck. We ate lunch together because I wanted to get him sober. So we ate lunch together while I'm talking to him. My wife was there. He fell asleep in his food. Fell right in his food. Got up and wiped his face. And, and I just bled in my heart and said, oh, God. And I ministered to him and I shook his tree. Heard from his brother and his sister-in-law. He stopped drinking. He's still working on all the areas, but he stopped drinking because he would have been dead. Come on, saints. And have you know, because we don't have ownership of our time, we waste opportunities. Wow. Now look at this. Have you know, the law that I've just preached to you about is a pathway. It means teaching. And here's the thing I want to introduce you to. There's a Hebrew term that I need to help you with to show you a pathway in God for every day. It becomes the rudder of a ship. How you know a ship needs a rudder? It don't know where to go. And it becomes a spiritual rudder in our every day. I believe in a first life principle in God. How you know God is a God of the first? Matthew 6, 33, I said it a minute ago. A minute ago. Seek ye. See, I believe in a first fruits ministry of first gives to God. First fruits to God. When I get up every day, I never get out of my bed. I never get out of my bed. True? I never get out of my bed till I have spent time with God. Because the person that you listen to in the morning will be the voice you obey all day. So I start my day off and I will not get out of my bed until I have had time to reconnect to my God and say, Lord, I'm here. I'm here afresh today. Thank you for life. And I thank you that I get to serve you. Amen. How many say amen? amen. Now, now, let me just help you. You still with me? Okay, stay with me. This is going to be, you, you're going to like this at the end here. So I believe in a first life principle. God must be first in everything. How many want him to be first in everything? Matthew 20, 16 says, the last shall be first. Can you hear that? 450 scriptures about first. The first commandment is to love the Lord. Jesus is the first. He's the alpha. He's the first born among many brethren. Losing our first love is a tragedy. Revelation 4.1 says, John said, Jesus was the first voice he heard. How many of you say, Lord, I need to learn to discipline my time where the first voice I hear is his. 
That's how come later in the day, I know between the voice of me and the voice of him. Because when the morning rises, my head is clear. How do you know what sleep does? Sleep is a natural mind restorational factor. It's proven medically. When you sleep at night, not in church, when you sleep at night, you restore your mind. Your mind is renewed. If you're not sleeping at night, there are a lot of problems. You're eating problems, television problems, worry problems, all those things. Putting your face in front of a television, the light in it itself will keep you awake. Worry will keep you awake. Come on. I learned years ago, go to sleep because I can't fix what I need to fix without my God. So when I go to sleep, he renews my mind. That's naturally. So when I wake up, the first thing I do in the morning is say, good morning, God. What are we doing? Because look, some of you don't realize there were days I used to wake up and I was amazed I wasn't dead. I woke up in jail. Somebody the other day, was I was on a trip, and somebody said, oh, I was in South Carolina. I was in Myrtle Beach. And I said, yeah, I was too. I got arrested. (laughs) And they went, what? I woke up in jail. I woke up in the hospital. I woke up one time after being in a fight. I woke up that next morning after being drunk, and I was in bed. I went to get out of bed, and I couldn't get out of bed. I rolled back. I had a cast from my hip to my ankle. I didn't even know I got it. I woke up one night, one morning, and my eye was shut tight as it could because it got hit in the head with a bat. Hello. I woke up. I had stitches in my hand. Where'd they come from? So now I wake up. I'm alive. Thank God I'm alive. I get another day. Watch this. That's why the Sabbath is so important. Jesus, prophetically speaking today, yea, saith the Lord, Jesus wants us to slow down and let him be first. Come on. Do you know God's last day became the first day of the man? Oh, think about it. The last day of God was a day of rest. And the first day of man fell on the last day, and that's when man began to live. God said, I want to teach you a principle. Start your day off in rest, and then fulfill my will. How do you know Today is the Sabbath for us. This is the day to rest. Not sleep, but rest. And let the Holy Spirit renew you and speak to you and refresh you. Because tomorrow is the day to work. But today is the day of the Lord. It is the day of the rest of the Sabbath of God so we can hear God. And those of you that refuse and run all over the place and refuse to slow down and give God a a second of your time, you stay broke, you stay in turmoil, and you are constantly dealing with depressions and other things. You can rest today. Because tomorrow, you get to live. I hope you're listening. Revelation 8.1, remember I taught about this. The heaven was silent for 30 minutes because of prayer. Wow. Look at this. Jesus came to the disciples, found them asleep and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? How many of you know, I feel the same way. Hello, I'm Peter today. Could you not stay awake for one hour? (laughs) 
I laugh. If you knew how serious I was, you'd really straighten your spine up and sit up and say, you know what? I am not going to let Satan put, tell me this. You pay $20 to go to a movie and you go to sleep in it. You're lying through your teeth. You don't go over here to the movie and watch a stupid movie and, and go, oh man, I'm here. Pay $20. I can go to sleep now. How many say, Lord, here it is now. Here's a phrase. The Old Testament word was moda, moda, ana, moda, ana, M-O-D-E-H-A-N-I. It means, oh, I acknowledge and I give thanks on the first day. The first word, do you know, do you know that the Israelite, to this day, still That's how the Israelite wakes up every morning and sings that song to the Lord. I am glad that it is morning. I am glad I am alive. Some of you pull the covers up and say, oh God, it's another day. Because you're not waking up to him. You're waking up to you. You're waking up to your problem. You're waking up to your negativity. You're waking up to your fear. But if you wake up to him, he's the author, the finisher of your faith. He'll give you hope, love, joy, and peace. So you imagine Sister Corley and I in the morning? Good morning. How are you? I know. <laughs> there was a cartoon character. They called him Mr. Grump or something. Remember him? It was a. Uh, Hello. He had a real rough voice. Oscar the Grouch. Remember Oscar? They used to sell an alarm clock that had a trash can. And when it was time to get up, do you remember that? Trash can lid would pop off. He'd say, get up, get up, get up, get up. He'd get louder and louder. I was at somebody's house. I broke it to a hundred pieces. I attacked it like it was the devil himself. Shut up. You're not telling me anything again. Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I would say, Lord, thank you for peace. You know why my voice would bother you? Because demons in hell are sucking the life out of your soul, trying to seduce you and keep you from listening to the voice of God. What I'm doing when I do that, and I played that little silly song, is to shake hell wide open and have you go, wait a minute, I'm being played a game here. I need to get my act together and get up in the morning and serve the first one that I hear who is my God, my source, and my hope. And the end. You say, well, where's, the, the, where's the third chicken? Where's the... And we say, Lord, I'm going to offer you a first fruits offering. What's the first fruit, saints? The first apple, the first tomato? Give him a first fruits offering. Say, Lord, I'm going to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I love you. I give thanks. That little song says, it's another wonderful morning. Sounds like Mr. Rogers, but it's another wonderful morning. 
Come on. Psalm 100. Psalm 100 verse 4. Enter in his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. Now, there is the wisdom of the rooster. We start off each day thanking God. In ancient Jewish wisdom, I looked this up. There's the story of the rooster. Oh, what revelation. Tells us that we are to thank God for giving the rooster understanding to distinguish between day and night. The rooster was nature's alarm clock, an amazing thing that God gave man a wake-up call long before electricity and clocks. It is called the wisdom of the rooster. Now, night and day, light and darkness are easy to distinguish. The rooster, we think, sees the light appearing to take away the darkness, and then he begins to crow. But that's not true. Because the rooster crows before he sees the light. They sense that dawn will break soon and that the light is on its way to remove the darkness. That's why they crow. Luke twenty two sixty one. 61, Jesus said this to Peter. Peter, he said, you will deny me. And he said three times by the time the rooster crows the second time, uh, he said, you will have denied me. The rooster was crowing uh, ahead of time because he saw the light coming, uh, which was Jesus Christ coming out of the tomb and the rooster by God's nature made him say hey Peter wake up the light's coming the wisdom of the rooster the rooster was the prophetic symbol announcing Jesus, the light of the world, was about to rise from the dead remember the rooster, crow, rooster crows before the light breaks through how do you hear that have you read John 13? You'll see it, verse 36 through 38. It's the whole story about Jesus and the resurrection. That whole story. How many of you know why Jesus said to Peter, you'll deny me? Because Peter said, I want to be with you when you go and in your glory. I want to be there. I want to be a part of your resurrection. And, and look, he said to him, no, you can't be there. He said, where I'm going, you can't go. But when I, when I get time, you're going to come with me. But the whole story was about the resurrection and the rooster who's played this awesome Jewish part all this time has just been in our little sermons about Peter's pitiful condition. It was not just Peter's pitiful condition. It was a prophetic announcement uh, that even nature was saying, hey, the king of glory is about ready to arise on the earth. And I'm here to tell you this day that all over the world, uh, nature is beginning to shift. Uh, nature's beginning to shake. Uh, nature's beginning to move because they're announcing uh, the whole earth uh, is groaning uh, for the mature saints of God to be revealed. Uh, and God is about ready to shake this thing wide open. And the rooster is crowing like you can't believe. And I'm here to tell you, I'm nothing more than a prophetic rooster. Woo! Look, 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 look! I'm here to wake you up. I'm here to announce to you today. Look, look, look! The Lord Himself in His glory is coming, and He's coming with all the angels, and His majesty will fill the heavens. And yea, saith the Lord, it's a glorious day. Give God some praise and wake up. Wake up. Give him glory. Give him glory. Moda anana. Moda anana. Give thanks this morning. Give thanks this morning. Give thanks and acknowledge him. And say, Lord, uh, this is the day that you have uh, made. Uh, and you're letting nature uh, send earthquakes uh, and rainstorms uh, and hurricanes. Uh, and you're trying to wake up mankind uh, to hear that all oh, the 
the sound of the Lord is beginning to ring through the world and his announcement that the King of glory, he's coming. And some of you, you say, well, I don't see him. Remember, the rooster did not wait till the light showed up. The rooster announced his coming before he ever rose from the dead. Because remember, it was on the second crow, not the third. The rooster said to, it said to Peter, he cock a doodle dooed one time. Then he cock a doodle dooed the second time. The third time, he said, I don't need to give any more warning because the light has come and the light came out of the tomb and rose up and the king of glory walked on the earth uh, and the rooster bowed down and said, I've announced he's come. That's all I was here to do. And I'm here to tell you, prophets and preachers around the nation are starting to get the picture that if we'll just begin to proclaim uh, it is a new day, uh, it is the first day of the week, uh, it is the day of our Sabbath here that we must learn to rest in God uh, and we must must hear the prophetic sound uh, for the rooster is announcing uh, he's coming, uh, his glory's coming, uh, waves of his glory. You sit with your hands folded because you have not uh, heard. But when your hands go up, uh, there's something inside of you that says, I want the king, I want him. Put your hands up like you love him. Uh, put your hands up in some kind of surrender. Close your eyes and stop looking all over the place uh, and answer the question. Have you got time for Jesus? Have you got time for Jesus? Have you got time for Jesus? Have you got time for him? Can you make time for him? For it is his time. He chose to assemble his people in those three feasts. And thank God they were in Jerusalem on the Passover. Because there would not have been a Pentecost if they hadn't gone on the Passover. But because they went to the Passover, the lamb could be slain. And because of the Passover, the next thing that came was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Thank God there was a Passover. Thank God there was a Pentecost. And thank God there is an ingathering of the Feast of Tabernacle. We are here today tabernacling with God. We are here in the tabernacle of God, eating in the open heavens. We're eating at the table of the Lord. And there's an open heaven over the church, uh, over this place, uh, over this house. Uh, and God wants us to know that we are today in the feast of gathering, the feast of tabernacle. That's why from the north and south, east and west, uh, there needs to be a regathering in the house. Uh, there needs to be a holy alarm. Uh, send out the sound of the rooster and tell all those that will hear, do not run again. Uh, do not pull away again, uh, for there will be no grace. Uh, there will be no mercy, for God uh, will cause his hand uh, to be lifted. Uh, I have a word for some of you that I could prophesy to you today that you are flirting with Satan himself. And I'm telling you and you know who I am and who I'm talking to. You come and you get up the front and you dance and then you can't dance no more and then you can't sit up front and you, you start sitting back further and then further and then further and Satan will seduce you and take you out of the church uh, and cause your life to be more miserable uh, then than it is now and you'll begin to understand what happened. You lost that place in God. 
Oh, I could prophesy some of you that have grown up tasting God. You have heritage that God spoke to your grandfathers and to your fathers and to your mothers and your aunts. And yet you play this game with God that you think you have your own time. You don't have your time. Your time is God's time. He wants you to redeem the time for the day on the earth is evil. And he wants you to buy back some time and say, God, I'll not be a second class citizen. I'll not be an also ran. I'll not be those that come in at the end. I'll be those that run and run to the front and run to the place where God can use me because I'm going to give the first fruit of my lips to the Lord. Will you tell the Lord today, I will wake up in the morning. Come on. Say, I will wake up in the morning. I will give you my time. I will wake up in the morning and give you my time. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Pray with me right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray this prayer with you right now. This little silly song that the Jew sings doesn't sing it because it's a silly song. He sings it because he knows that it gives him an audience with the Creator, God. And I want to say this to you. God has sent a rooster this morning. And I could prophesy to some of you sitting right here. Some of you ladies, listen to me. You connect yourself with ungodly men and they are here to seduce you and take you out of God. Because they have no intention of serving God. They only want to serve themselves. I want you to hear that. And you've heard it from the mouth of a prophetic rooster. Rise up and be smart. And look at that individual and say, if you want to be with me, you must come and serve the Lord. Ladies, I warn you right now, do not let them. And those of you that stand on the outside edges and you've known God all these years, I send you a prophetic word this morning from the rooster of God. There's a warning. I've cock a twice. And there's a warning to you because you've lived your life in denying him. And today he says, I want the first fruits of your life. I want the first fruits of your offering of your mouth. I want the first fruits of your offerings of your hands. I want I want the first fruits of the offerings of your time. I want the first fruits of everything that's mine, saith the Lord. I've come to collect what's mine. Be not like the fool who said, oh, my wealth and my good has come in such a way. I will build bigger barns and tear down my barns because I'm so blessed. And the Lord says, you fool, this day Your life is required of you. I tell the story because it's relative. I warned a young girl right here, do not go home. She went home. Everybody was listening. The man, her boyfriend, stabbed her 17 times and killed her. I warned the man before it happens, sitting right over there. Do not run from God. For I saw a vision of a spotlight out. And the camera was on him. And I said, you will go to prison for 10 years. And you'll be caught 
under the spotlight of a camera from a helicopter. Two days later, they called me. I watched the news, Channel 13. They had the helicopter, and there he was laying in the street, and the light was on him, and it was the brother that I spoke to. After 10 years of being in prison, he came down here and hugged me and thanked me for speaking to him because he joined the chaplaincy program in prison and got his life right with God. I stood in this church. The woman that I spoke to was here Thursday night, back in the back. I was preaching. I got down and went all the way to the back. And I said, put your hands up, mother, right now. Put them up right now. Because your son's been in a car wreck and he is injured severely. And it's life and death. Put your hands up right now. And she raised her hands and her husband was a policeman. You know the story. He was a policeman. And they got up after I walked back here. They got up, went to the hospital. When they went home, the recorder was on. It was his sister, her sister. Her sister said, you got to get to the hospital right now. Your son's in a wreck. He went through the windshield. And it's not good. The other boy's dead. She rushed to the hospital. In tears, went into the room, the emergency room. The father, the husband, the police officer, because he knew what to do, he went over to the intake desk and he said, she told him who he was, I'm a police officer. He said, let me have, let me have that. I want to see that report. I spoke to her at 11 something, 11.10. The accident was at 11.09. He lived. God rescued him. And I could do that right here for an hour. What am I doing? I'm the rooster this morning. I'm taking on the role of the rooster. Please attend to the, your son, your brother. Please attend to him. It's okay. He, he has an issue. We understand. It's okay. We love him. Father, thank you. Heal him, Lord. But the enemy cannot disrupt what I'm doing right now. I'm going to close, get you to close your eyes. God brought you here today to hear me. And I say this to you. Let God be God. Let every man be a liar. And make this your commitment to God. If you're not saved today, you're not walking with God, you're not right with God, you're backslidden, you're cold, you're indifferent, I don't care what it is. Would you listen to the voice of the rooster that says to you, this is a warning, for the light is coming, and today's the day of salvation to get it right with God. If you're here today, heads are bowed, no one looking around, please, this is not a spectator sport. This is about getting right with God. If you're here today, I don't want anybody looking. I want you to just lift your hand up right where you're at and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to get it right today. If you're here today, yes. Anybody else? Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up so I can pray with you. Yes. Hold it up. I'm going to pray my best prayer. Yes, 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 yes. Hold it up. Hold it up. I'm going to pray my best prayer for you. Just put it up. Don't be afraid and don't be ashamed. Yes, I see your hand. It's okay. I see that hand there. That's good. God brought you here today because God's going to work this thing out. God's going to do something. I'm just a rooster today. I, I, I'm just the rooster that came to help you hear the word of the Lord and to hear the alarm of God that it's time. Stop playing around and get it right. Those with your hands up, run down here right now so I can pray with you. Just get up and come right now. Right now. Just get out of your seat and come. Don't hesitate another minute. Get up right now. It'll be Satan that seduces you and lies to you. Just come right now. 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 Altar workers, anybody else that we need help with, get them down here. Get them down here. Come on, they're coming. Julie, right behind you. Turn around right there, right there. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Father, in Jesus' name, reach your hand out this way. Reach your hand out, pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray with those that have come down today. I pray that they will hear the word of the Lord and no longer run, but no longer hide, but Lord, decide that it's time to give him the first fruits of their love. The first fruit of your adoration to God. First fruit of your love to him. Don't run from God anymore. 
Don't run from God anymore. This is the day to get it right with God. Stop running. You can outrun God. He has a divine plan for you. He has purpose. He has strength. It's Him. Give Him first fruits in the morning. Sing the little song that says, I'm thankful that I'm alive. I thank God that He's the King. And I'm so thankful that I get to serve and love Him. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for those that are here right now. And I pray that you would awaken their spirit, awaken them in their hearts, that this day would be the beginning of a change. Pray real prayers now. Don't you pray any soft little, silly little prayers, folks, down here at this altar. You better pray the prayer of faith. I want to see some action in your prayer. So I want to see you praying like you're determined that God's going to break this yoke and break off this thing and break off this devilish attack over their life in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for the church uh, that tomorrow morning we'll arise out of this Sabbath. Uh, we'll arise and put our hands up and give God great thanks uh, and offer God the first fruits of our lips uh, and give Him the great praise that He's worthy of. Give Him the great adoration that He's worthy of. May we decide to change the thing uh, May we decide that this uh, feast uh, that's coming up, uh, this tabernacle that God has called us to next Sunday, next week, God, is our tabernacle time. It's our time uh, to hear the rooster and hear God say, come and sit before me and I'll feed you. I'll feed you manna. I'll feed you right out of heaven. I'll feed you the word of the Lord. Karabanduri shelabaka. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen to me. And you can keep praying. I don't care about that here, this altar. I don't care about that. Those of you there, listen to me. Here's what you're going to do. I'm going to ask you to give today. I'm going to ask you to give a good offering today because we need to get ourselves up enough so we can go through this next week with the convention and all that's coming. How I many you know it's time to invest in the house of God, saints? How I many you know it's time to put time where it should be, value where it should be? How many of you value the Lord? How many of you value this church? How many of you value what just happened here today? How many of you got a word from the Lord today, even if it was from a rooster? Yeah. How, many of you say, how many of you go away and say, I went to church and a rooster spoke? Man, people will want to know what that message is. Here's what I want you to do. Listen to me good. I want you to give. I want you to give a good offering so we can go into next week and be where we need to be. So here's what I want you to do. I need you to do this. I need, I need 15 people. I need 15 people that will do this, will join me and give a good offering this morning. The rest of us are going to give, but I need 15 people that will believe God for a thousand dollars in this offering so we can get this thing through. And, and we, just, we just had to pay some bills we didn't know we were gonna have to pay and we need to get all that straight. Uh, how many of you know we had one of our air conditions blow up and we've gotta get that straight. We've got a couple things we're trying to deal with and we just gotta get through and get to next week so we can have convention and celebrate. Because during that, I don't, I don't try to take up a lot of offerings during that week. I take the offering, but I don't try to spend any big time. So let's do that ahead of time. So today, I want to pray right now. Everybody, just pray with me. And those of you, you can't give a thousand. I understand that. You can give a hundred. You can give fifty. You can give whatever it takes. Let me tell you something. God so loved the world that He gave. And if you want to find where Jesus was in the New Testament. Go check him out sitting watching the widow give because he wanted to see how much she gave. She gave the mites. If you think giving has something to do with some other thing other than God, you have no clue who God is because God's a giving God. And he's brought us to this church. We have a wonderful church. Look what happened Saturday. 400 kids got touched and ministered to. Let's do this right and let's do this now. So pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray right now there's those in this room that can do this. And I'm believing that they will help make this offering go where it needs to go. So I'm asking you right now, if that's you, you say, I've got that, that $1,000, I'll give it. I'll give that $1,000 and I'll make that commitment right now. You do that today so that we can move over this edge 
and you do that and let God bless you and let God bless the house. I pray that God speaks to you right now. This is the way you get blessed, saints. This is the way you get blessed. If you don't know how to get blessed, this is the way. So I bless you. I'll be giving my part. I'll do the same, but I ask you to join me. Now, all of you that will join me in every area, $50, $100, whatever it is, $500, $300, it don't matter. Just ask God right now. Lord, I thank you that you'll speak to your people right now. And Lord, I speak peace in every lying devil. Silence. And let our people hear the voice of God. Lord, I thank you today. Baptize these that came today that need to be. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Do miracles in their lives. And I thank you for this offering. And every one of you, do something. And the 15, obey God and let God bless you. Do it now. Slip right up here. Be sensitive to those praying. And come right now and bring that to the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Let's sing to the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah.